Introduction to The Minister's Wooing. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Minister's Wooing by Harriet Beecher Stowe. Introduction. The author has endeavored in this story to paint a style of life and manners which existed in New England in the earlier days of her national existence. Some of the principal characters are historic. The leading events of the story are founded on actual facts, although the author has taken the liberty to arrange and vary them for the purposes of the story. The author has executed the work with a reverential tenderness for those great and religious minds who laid in New England the foundations of many generations, and for those institutions and habits of life from which, as from a fruitful germ, sprang all the present prosperity of America. Such as it is, it is commended to the kindly thoughts of that British fireside from which the fathers and mothers of America first went out to give to English ideas and institutions a new growth in a new world. H. B. Stowe, 18 Montague Street, Russell Square, August 25th, 1859. End of the Introduction Section 1 of the minister's wooing this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org the minister's wooing by harriet beecher stowe chapter 1 mrs katie scudder had invited mrs brown and mrs jones and deacon twitchell's wife to take tea with her on the afternoon of june second a d 17 x when one has a story to tell, one is always puzzled which end of it to begin at. You have a whole corps of people to introduce that you know and your reader doesn't, and one thing so presupposes another that, whichever way you turn your patchwork, the figures still seem ill-arranged. The small item that I have given will do as well as any other to begin with, as it certainly will lead you to ask, Pray, who is Mrs. Katie Scudder? And this will start me systematically on my story. You must understand that in the then small seaport town of Newport, at that time unconscious of its present fashion and fame, there lived nobody in those days who did not know the widow Scudder. In New England settlements a custom has obtained, which is wholesome and touching, of ennobling the woman whom God has made desolate, by a sort of brevet rank which continually speaks for her as a claim on the respect and consideration of the community. The widow Jones, or Brown, or Smith, is one of the fixed institutions of every New England village, and doubtless the designation acts as a continual plea for one whom bereavement, like the lightning of heaven, has made sacred. The widow Scudder, however, was one of the sort of women who reign queens in whatever society they move in. Nobody was more quoted, more deferred to, or enjoyed more unquestioned position than she. She was not rich. A small farm with a modest, gambrel-roofed, one-story cottage was her sole domain but she was one of the much-admired class who, in the speech of New England, are said to have faculty, a gift which, among that shrewd people, commands more esteem than beauty, riches, learning, or any other worldly endowment. Faculty is Yankee for savoir-faire, and the opposite virtue to shiftlessness. Faculty is the greatest virtue, and shiftlessness the greatest vice of Yankee man and woman. To her who has faculty nothing shall be impossible, she shall scrub floors, wash, wring, bake, brew, and yet her hands shall be small and white. She shall have no perceptible income, yet always be handsomely dressed. She shall not have a servant in her house, with a dairy to manage, hired men to feed, a boarder or two to care for, unheard of pickling and preserving to do, and yet you commonly see her every afternoon sitting at her shady parlor window behind the lilacs, cool and easy, hemming muslin cap strings, or reading the last new book. She who hath faculty is never in a hurry, never behindhand. She can always step over to distressed Mrs. Smith, whose jelly won't come, and stop to show Mrs. Jones how she makes her pickle so green, and be ready to watch with poor old Mrs. Simpkins, who is down with the rheumatism. Of this genus was the widow Scudder, or, as the neighbors would have said of her, she that was Katie Stevens. Katie was the only daughter of a shipmaster, sailing from Newport Harbor, who was wrecked off the coast one cold December night, and left small fortune to his widow and only child. Katie grew up, however, a tall, straight, black-eyed girl, 
with eyebrows drawn true as a bow, a foot arched like a Spanish woman's, and a little hand which never saw the thing it could not do, quick of speech, ready of wit, and as such girls have a right to be, somewhat positive withal. Katie could harness a chaise, or row a boat. She could saddle and ride any horse in the neighborhood. She could cut any garment that ever was seen or thought of, make cake, jelly, and wine from her earliest years, in most precocious style, all without seeming to derange a sort of trim, well-kept air of ladyhood that sat jauntily on her. Of course, being young and lively, she had her admirers, and some well-to-do in worldly affairs laid their lands and houses at Katie's feet. But to the wonder of all, she would not even pick them up to look at them. People shook their heads and wondered whom Katie Stevens expected to get, and talked about going through the wood to pick up a crooked stick, till one day she astonished her world by marrying a man that nobody ever thought of her taking. George Scudder was a grave, thoughtful young man, not given to talking, and silent in the society of women, with that kind of reverential bashfulness which sometimes shows a pure, unworldly nature. How Katie came to fancy him everybody wondered, for he never talked to her, never so much as picked up her glove when it fell, never asked her to ride or sail, in short, everybody said she must have wanted him from sheer willfulness, because he, of all the young men of the neighborhood, never courted her. But Katie, having very sharp eyes, saw some things that nobody else saw. For example, you must know she discovered by mere accident that George Scudder always was looking at her, wherever she moved, though he looked away in a moment if discovered, and that an accidental touch of her hand or brush of her dress would send the blood into his cheek like the spirit in the tube of a thermometer. And so, as women are curious, you know, Katie amused herself with investigating the causes of these little phenomena, and before she knew it, got her foot caught in a cobweb that held her fast, and constrained her, whether she would or no, to marry a poor man that nobody cared much for but herself. George was, in truth, one of the sort who evidently have made some mistake in coming into this world at all, as their internal furniture is in no way suited to its general courses and currents. He was of the order of dumb poets, most wretched when put to the grind of the hard and actual. For if he who would utter poetry stretches out his hand to a gainsaying world, he is worse off still who is possessed with the desire of living it. Especially is this the case if he be born poor, and with a dire necessity upon him of making immediate efforts in the hard and actual. George had a helpless invalid mother to support, so though he loved reading and silent thought above all things, he put to instant use the only convertible worldly talent he possessed, which was a mechanical genius, and shipped at sixteen as a ship carpenter. He studied navigation in the forecastle, and found in its calm diagrams and tranquil eternal signs food for his thoughtful nature, and a refuge from the brutality and coarseness of sea life. He had a healthful, kindly animal nature, and so his inwardness did not ferment and turn to Byronic sourness and bitterness nor did he needlessly parade to everybody in his vicinity the great gulf which lay between him and them. He was called a good fellow, only a little lumpish, and as he was brave and faithful he rose in time to be a shipmaster. But when came the business of making money, the aptitude for accumulating, George found himself distanced by many a one with not half his general powers. What shall a man do with a sublime tier of moral faculties, when the most profitable business out of his port is the slave trade. So it was in Newport in those days. George's first voyage was on a slaver, and he wished himself dead many a time before it was over, and ever after would talk like a man beside himself if the subject was named. He declared that the gold made in it was distilled from human blood, from mother's tears, from the agonies and dying groans of gasping, suffocating men and women, and that it would sear and blister the soul of him that touched it. In short, he talked as whole-souled, unpractical fellows are apt to talk, about what respectable people sometimes do. Nobody had ever instructed him that a slave ship, with a procession of expectant sharks in its wake, is a missionary institution, by which closely packed heathens are brought over to enjoy the light of the gospel. So, though George was acknowledged to be a good fellow, and honest as the noon mark on the kitchen floor, he let slip so many chances of making money as seriously to compromise his reputation among thriving folks. He was wastefully generous, insisted on treating every poor dog that came in his way in any foreign port as a brother, 
absolutely refused to be party in cheating or deceiving the heathen on any shore or in skin of any color and also took pains as far as in him lay to spoil any bargains which any of his subordinates founded on the ignorance or weakness of his fellow men so he made voyage after voyage and gained only his wages and the reputation among his employers of an incorruptibly honest fellow to be sure it was said that he carried out books in his ship and read and studied and wrote observations on all the countries he saw which parson smith told miss dolly persimmon would really do credit to a printed book but then they never were printed or as miss dolly remarked of them they never seemed to come to anything and coming to anything as she understood it meant standing in definite relations to bread and butter george never cared however for money he made enough to keep his mother comfortable and that was enough for him till he fell in love with katie stevens he looked at her through those glasses which such men carry in their souls and she was a mortal woman no longer but a transfigured glorified creature an object of awe and wonder he was actually afraid of her her glove her shoe her needle thread and thimble her bonnet string everything in short she wore or touched became invested with a mysterious charm he wondered at the impudence of men that could walk up and talk to her that could ask her to dance with such an assured air now he wished he were rich he dreamed impossible chances of his coming home a millionaire to lay unknown wealth at katie's feet and when miss persimmon the ambulatory dressmaker of the neighborhood in making up a new black gown for his mother recounted how captain blatherin had sent katie stevens most the splendidest india shawl that she ever did see he was ready to tear his hair at the thought of his poverty but even in that hour of temptation he did not repent that he had refused all part and lot in the ship by which captain blatherum's money was made for he knew every timber of it to be seasoned by the groans and saturated with the sweat of human agony true love is a natural sacrament and if ever a young man thanks god for having saved what is noble and manly in his soul it is when he thinks of offering it to the woman he loves nevertheless the india shawl story cost him a night's rest nor was it till miss persimmon had ascertained by a private confabulation with katie's mother that she had indignantly rejected it and that she treated the captain real ridiculous that he began to take heart he ought not he said to stand in her way now when he had nothing to offer no he would leave katie free to do better if she could he would try his luck and if when he came home from the next voyage katie was disengaged why then he would lay all at her feet and so George was going to see, with a secret shrine in his soul, at which he was to burn unsuspected incense. But, after all, the mortal maiden whom he adored suspected this private arrangement, and contrived, as women will, to get her own key into the lock of his secret temple, because, as girls say, she was determined to know what was there. So one night she met him quite accidentally on the sea sands, struck up a little conversation, and begged him in such a pretty way to bring her a spotted shell from the south sea like the one on his mother's mantelpiece and looked so simple and childlike in saying it that our young man very imprudently committed himself by remarking that when people had rich friends to bring them all the world from foreign parts he never dreamed of her wanting so trivial a thing of course katie didn't know what he meant she hadn't heard of any rich friends and then came something about captain blatherum and katie tossed her head and said if anybody wanted to insult her they might talk to her about captain blatherum and then followed this that and the other till finally as you might expect out came all that never was to have been said and katie was almost frightened at the terrible earnestness of the spirit she had evoked she tried to laugh and ended by crying and saying she hardly knew what but when she came to herself in her own room at home she found on her finger a ring of African gold that George had put there, which she did not send back like Captain Blatherum's presence. Katie was like many intensely matter-of-fact and practical women who have not in themselves a bit of poetry or a particle of ideality, but who yet worship these qualities in others with the homage which the Indians paid to the unknown tongue of the first whites. They are secretly weary of a certain conscious dryness of nature in themselves and this weariness predisposes them to idolize the man who brings them this unknown gift. Naturalists say that every defect of organization has its compensation, 
and men of ideal natures find in the favor of women the equivalent for their disabilities among men do you remember at niagara a little cataract on the american side which throws its silver sheeny veil over a cave called the grot of rainbows whoever stands on a rock in that grotto sees himself in the center of a rainbow circle above below around in like manner merry chatty positive busy housewifely katie saw herself standing in a rainbow shrine in her lover's inner soul and liked to see herself so a woman by the by must be very insensible who is not moved to come upon a higher plane of being herself by seeing how undoubtedly she is ensphered in the heart of a good and noble man a good man's faith in you fair lady if you ever have it will make you better and nobler even before you know it katie made an excellent wife she took home her husband's old mother and nursed her with a dutifulness and energy worthy of all praise and made her own keen outward faculties and deft handiness a compensation for the defects in worldly estate nothing would make katie's bright eyes flash quicker than any reflection on her husband's want of luck in the material line she didn't know whose business it was if she was satisfied she hated these sharp gimlet gouging sort of men that would put a screw between body and soul for money george had that in him that nobody understood she would rather be his wife on bread and water than to take captain blatherham's house carriages and horses and all and she might have had em fast enough dear knows she was sick of making money when she saw what sort of men could make it and so on all which talk did her infinite credit because at bottom she did care and was naturally as proud and ambitious a little minx as ever breathed and was thoroughly grieved at heart at george's want of worldly success but like a nice little robin redbreast she covered up the grave of her worldliness with the leaves of true love and sang a who cares for that above it her thrifty management of the money her husband brought her soon bought a snug little farm and put up the little brown gambrel roofed cottage to which we directed your attention in the first of our story children were born to them and george found in short intervals between voyages his home an earthly paradise he was still sailing with the fond illusion in every voyage of making enough to remain at home when the yellow fever smote him under the line and the ship returned to newport without its captain george was a christian man he had been one of the first to attach himself to the unpopular and unworldly ministry of the celebrated dr h and to appreciate the sublime ideality and unselfishness of those teachings which then were awakening new sensations in the theological mind of new england katie too had become a professor with her husband in the same church and his death in the midst of life deepened the power of her religious impressions she became absorbed in religion after the fashion of new england where devotion is doctrinal not ritual as she grew older her energy of character her vigor and good judgment caused her to be regarded as a mother in israel the minister boarded at her house and it was she who was first to be consulted in all matters relating to the well-being of the church no woman could more manfully breast a long sermon or bring a more determined faith to the reception of a difficult doctrine to say the truth there lay at the bottom of her doctrinal system this stable cornerstone mr scudder used to believe it i will and after all that is said about independent thought isn't the fact that a just and good soul has thus or thus believed a more respectable argument than many that often are adduced if it be not more's the pity since two-thirds of the faith in the world is built on no better foundation in time george's old mother was gathered to her son and two sons and a daughter followed their father to the invisible one only remaining of the flock and she a person with whom you and i good reader have joint concern in the further unfolding of our story end of section one Section two of the Minister's Wooing. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Minister's Wooing by Harriet Beecher Stowe. Chapter two. As I before remarked, Mrs. Katie Scudder had invited company to tea. 
strictly speaking it is necessary to begin with the creation of the world in order to give a full account of anything but for popular use something less may serve one's turn and therefore i shall let the past chapter suffice to introduce my story and shall proceed to arrange my scenery and act my little play on the supposition that you know enough to understand things and persons being asked to tea in our new england in the year seventeen blank meant something very different from the same invitation in our more sophisticated days in those times people held to the singular opinion that the night was made to sleep in they inferred it from a general confidence they had in the wisdom of mother nature supposing that she did not put out her lights and draw her bed curtains and hush all noise in her great world house without strongly intending that her children should go to sleep and the consequence was that very soon after sunset the whole community very generally set their faces bedward and the tolling of the nine o'clock evening bell had an awful solemnity in it sounding to the full good society in new england in those days very generally took its breakfast at six its dinner at twelve and its tea at six company tea however among thrifty industrious folk was often taken an hour earlier because each of the invitees had children to put to bed or other domestic cares at home and as in those simple times people were invited because you wanted to see them a tea-party assembled themselves at three and held session till sundown when each matron rolled up her knitting work and wended soberly home though newport even in those early times was not without its families which affected state and splendour rolled about in carriages with armorial emblazonments and had servants in abundance to every turn within doors yet there as elsewhere in new england the majority of the people lived with the wholesome thrifty simplicity of the olden time when labour and intelligence went hand in hand in perhaps a greater harmony than the world has ever seen our scene opens in the great old-fashioned kitchen which on ordinary occasions is the family dining and sitting-room of the scudder family i know fastidious moderns think that the working-room wherein are carried on the culinary operations of a large family must necessarily be an untidy and comfortless sitting-place but it is only because they are ignorant of the marvellous workings which pertain to the organ of faculty on which we have before insisted the kitchen of a new england matron was her throne-room her pride it was the habit of her life to produce the greatest possible results there with the slightest possible discomposure and what any woman could do mrs Katy scudder could do par excellence everything there seemed to be always done and never doing washing and baking those formidable disturbers of the composure of families were all over within those two or three morning hours when we are composing ourselves for a last nap and only the fluttering of linen over the green yard on monday mornings proclaimed that the dreaded solemnity of a wash had transpired a breakfast arose there as by magic and in an incredibly short space after every knife fork spoon and trencher clean and shining was looking as innocent and unconscious in its place as if it never had been used and never expected to be the floor perhaps sir you remember your grandmother's floor of snowy boards sanded with whitest sand you remember the ancient fireplace stretching quite across one end a vast cavern in each corner of which a cosy seat might be found distant enough to enjoy the crackle of the great jolly wood fire across the room ran a dresser on which was displayed great store of shining pewter dishes and plates which always shone with the same mysterious brightness and by the side of the fire a commodious wooden settee or settle offered repose to people too little accustomed to luxury to ask for a cushion 
oh that kitchen of the olden times the old clean roomy new england kitchen who that has breakfasted dined and supped in one has not cheery visions of its thrift its warmth its coolness the noon mark on its floor was a dial that told of some of the happiest days thereby did we write up the shortcomings of the solemn old clock that tick-tacked in the corner and whose ticks seemed mysterious prophecies of unknown good yet to arise out of the hours of life how dreamy the winter twilight came in there as yet the candles were not lighted when the crickets chirped around the dark stone hearth and shifting tongues of flame flickered and cast dancing shadows and elfish lights on the walls while grandmother nodded over her knitting work and puss purred and old rover lay dreamily opening now one eye and then the other on the family group with all our sealed houses let us not forget our grandmother's kitchens but we must pull up however and back to our subject matter which is in the kitchen of mrs katy scudder who has just put into the oven by the fireplace some wondrous tea rusks for whose composition she is renowned she has examined and pronounced perfect a loaf of cake which has been prepared for the occasion and which as usual is done exactly right the best room too has been opened and aired the white window curtain saluted with a friendly little shake as when one says how do you do to a friend for you must know clean as our kitchen is we are genteel and have something better for company our best room in here has a polished little mahogany tea-table and six mahogany chairs with claw talons grasping balls the white sanded floor is crinkled in curious little waves like those on the sea beach and right across the corner stands the buffet as it is called with its transparent glass doors wherein are displayed the solemn appurtenances of company tea-table there you may see a set of real china teacups which george bought in canton and had marked with his and his wife's joint initials a small silver cream pitcher which has come down as an heirloom from unknown generations silver spoons and delicate china cake plates which have been all carefully reviewed and wiped on napkins of mrs scudder's own weaving her cares now over she stands drying her hands on a roller towel in the kitchen while her only daughter the gentle mary stands in the doorway with the afternoon sun streaming in spots of flickering golden light on her smooth pale brown hair a petite figure in a full stuff petticoat and white short gown she stands reaching up one hand and cooing to something among the apple blossoms and now a jabba dove comes whirring down and settles on her finger and we that have seen pictures think as we look on her girlish face with its lines of statuesque beauty on the tremulous half infantine expression of her lovely mouth and the general air of simplicity and purity of some old pictures of the girlhood of the virgin but mrs scudder was thinking of no such popish matter i can assure you not she i don't think you could have done her a greater indignity than to mention her daughter in any such connection she had never seen a painting in her life and therefore was not to be reminded of them and furthermore the dove was evidently for some reason no favourite for she said in a quick imperative tone come come child don't fool with that bird it's high time we were dressed and ready and mary blushing as it would seem even to her hair gave a little toss and sent the bird like a silver fluttering cloud up among the rosy apple blossoms and now she and her mother have gone to their respective little bedrooms for the adjustment of their toilets and while the door is shut and nobody hears us we shall talk to you about mary newport at the present day blooms like a flower garden with young ladies of the best ton lovely girls hopes of their families possessed of amiable tempers and immensely large trunks 
and capable of sporting ninety changes in thirty days and otherwise rapidly emptying the purses of distressed fathers and whom yet travellers and the world in general look upon as genuine specimens of the kind of girls formed by american institutions we fancy such a one lying in a rustling silk negligee and amid a gentle generality of rings ribbons puffs laces bow and dinner discussion reading our humble sketch and what favour shall our poor heroine find in her eyes for though her mother was a world of energy and faculty in herself considered and had bestowed on this one little lone chick all the vigour and all the care and all the training which would have sufficed for a family of sixteen there were no results produced which could be made appreciable in the eyes of such company she could not waltz or polk or speak bad french or sing italian songs but nevertheless we must proceed to say what was her education and what her accomplishments well then she could both read and write fluently in the mother tongue she could spin both on the little and the great wheel and there were numberless towels napkins sheets and pillow-cases in the household store that could attest the skill of her pretty fingers she had worked several samplers of such rare merit that they hung framed in different rooms of the house exhibiting every variety and style of possible letter in the best marking stitch she was skilful in all sewing and embroidery in all shaping and cutting with a quiet and deft handiness that constantly surprised her energetic mother who could not conceive that so much could be done with so little noise in fact in all household lore she was a veritable good fairy her knowledge seemed unerring and intuitive and whether she washed or ironed or moulded biscuit or conserved plums her gentle beauty seemed to turn to poetry all the prose of life there was something in mary however which divided her as by an appreciable line from ordinary girls of her age from her father she had inherited a deep and thoughtful nature predisposed to moral and religious exaltation had she been born in italy under the dissolving influences of that sunny dreamy clime beneath the shadow of cathedrals and where pictured saints and angels smiled in clouds of painting from every arch and altar she might like fair saint catherine of siena have seen beatific visions in the sunset skies and a silver dove descending upon her as she prayed but unfolding in the clear keen cold new england clime and nurtured in its abstract and positive theologies her religious faculties took other forms instead of lying entranced in mysterious raptures at the foot of altars she read and pondered treatises on the will and listened in rapt attention while her spiritual guide the venerated dr h unfolded to her the theories of the great edwards on the nature of true virtue woman-like she felt the subtle poetry of these sublime abstractions which dealt with such infinite and unknown quantities which spoke of the universe of its great architect of men of angels as matters of intimate and daily contemplation and her teacher a grand-minded and simple-hearted man as ever lived was often amazed at the tread with which this fair young child walked through these high regions of abstract thought often comprehending through an ethereal clearness of nature what he had laboriously and heavily reasoned out and sometimes when she turned her grave childlike face upon him with some question or reply the good man started as if an angel had looked suddenly out upon him from a cloud unconsciously to himself he often seemed to follow her as dante followed the flight of beatrice through the ascending circles of the celestial spheres when her mother questioned him anxiously of her daughter's spiritual estate he answered that she was a child of a strange graciousness of nature and of a singular genius 
to which katie responded with a woman's pride that she was all her father over again it is only now and then that a matter-of-fact woman is sublimated by a real love but if she is it is affecting to see how impossible it is for death to quench it for in the child the mother feels that she has a mysterious and undying repossession of the father but in truth mary was only a recast in feminine form of her father's nature the elixir of the spirit that sparkled within her was of that quality of which the souls of poets and artists are made but the keen new england air crystallizes emotions into ideas and restricts many a poetic soul to the necessity of expressing itself only in practical living the rigid theological discipline of new england is fitted to produce rather strength and purity than enjoyment it was not fitted to make a sensitive and thoughtful nature happy however it might ennoble and exalt the system of dr h was one that could only have had its origin in a soul at once reverential and logical a soul moreover trained from its earliest years in the habits of thought engendered by monarchical institutions for although he like other ministers took an active part as a patriot in the revolution still he was brought up under the shadow of a throne and a man cannot ravel out the stitches in which early days have knit him his theology was in fact the turning to an invisible sovereign of that spirit of loyalty and unquestioning subjugation which is one of the noblest capabilities of our nature and as a gallant soldier renounces life and personal aims in the cause of his king and country and holds himself ready to be drafted for a forlorn hope to be shot down or help make a bridge of his mangled body over which the more fortunate shall pass to victory and glory so he regarded himself as devoted to the king eternal ready in his hands to be used to illustrate and build up an eternal commonwealth either by being sacrificed as a lost spirit or glorified as a redeemed one ready to throw not merely his mortal life but his immortality even into the forlorn hope to bridge with a never dying soul the chasm over which white-robed victors should pass to a commonwealth of glory and splendor whose vastness should dwarf the misery of all the lost to an infinitesimal it is not in our line to imply the truth or the falsehood of those systems of philosophic theology which seem for many years to have been the principal outlet for the proclivities of the new england mind but as psychological developments they have an intense interest he who does not see a grand side to these strivings of the soul cannot understand one of the noblest capabilities of humanity no real artist or philosopher ever lived who has not at some hours risen to the height of utter self-abnegation for the glory of the invisible there have been painters who would have been crucified to demonstrate the action of a muscle chemists who would gladly have melted themselves and all humanity in their crucible if so a new discovery might arise out of its fumes even persons of mere artistic sensibility are at times raised by music painting or poetry to a momentary trance of self-oblivion in which they would offer their whole being before the shrine of an invisible loveliness these hard old new england divines were the poets of metaphysical philosophy who built systems in an artistic fervor and felt self exhale from beneath them as they rose into the higher regions of thought but where theorists and philosophers tread with sublime assurance woman often follows with bleeding footsteps women are always turning from the abstract to the individual and feeling where the philosopher only thinks 
it was easy enough for mary to believe in self-renunciation for she was one with a born vocation for martyrdom and so when the idea was put to her of suffering eternal pains for the glory of god and the good of being in general she responded to it with a sort of sublime thrill such as it is given to some natures to feel in view of uttermost sacrifice but when she looked around on the warm living faces of friends acquaintances and neighbours viewing them as possible candidates for dooms so fearfully different she sometimes felt the walls of her faith closing round her as an iron shroud she wondered that the sun could shine so brightly that flowers could flaunt such dazzling colours that sweet airs could breathe and little children play and youth love and hope and a thousand intoxicating influences combined to cheat the victims from the thought that their next step might be into an abyss of horrors without end the blood of youth and hope was saddened by this great sorrow which lay ever on her heart and her life unknown to herself was a sweet tune in the minor key it was only in prayer or deeds of love and charity or in rapt contemplation of that beautiful millennial day which her spiritual guide most delighted to speak of that the tone of her feelings ever rose to the height of joy among mary's young associates was one who had been as a brother to her childhood he was her mother's cousin's son and so by a sort of family immunity had always a free access to her mother's house he took to the sea as the most bold and resolute young men will and brought home from foreign parts those new modes of speech those other eyes for received opinions and established things which so often shock established prejudices so that he was held as little better than an infidel and a castaway by the stricter religious circles in his native place mary's mother now that mary was grown up to woman's estate looked with a severe eye on her cousin she warned her daughter against too free an association with him and so we all know what comes to pass when girls are constantly warned not to think of a man the most conscientious and obedient little person in the world mary resolved to be very careful she never would think of james except of course in her prayers but as these were constant it may easily be seen it was not easy to forget him all that was so often told her of his carelessness his trifling his contempt of orthodox opinions and his startling and bold expressions only wrote his name deeper in her heart for was not his soul in peril could she look in his frank joyous face and listen to his thoughtless laugh and then think that a fall from a masthead or one night storm might ah with what images her faith filled the blank could she believe all this and forget him you see instead of getting our tea ready as we promised at the beginning of this chapter we have filled it with descriptions and meditations and now we foresee that the next chapter will be equally far from the point but have patience with us for we can write only as we are driven and never know exactly where we are going to land End of section two. Section three of the minister's wooing. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The minister's wooing by Harriet Beecher Stowe. Chapter three a quiet maiden-like place was mary's little room the window looked out under the overarching boughs of a thick apple orchard now all in a blush with blossoms and pink tip buds and the light came golden green strained through flickering leaves and an ever gentle rustle and whir of branches and blossoms a chitter of birds and an indefinite whispering motion as the long heads of orchard grass nodded and bowed to each other under the trees seemed to give the room the quiet hush of some little side chapel in a cathedral 
where green and golden glass softens the sunlight and only the sigh and rustle of kneeling worshippers break the stillness of the aisles it was small enough for a nun's apartment and dainty in its neatness as the waxen cell of a bee the bed and low window were draped in spotless white with fringes of mary's own nodding a small table under the looking-glass bore the library of a well-taught young woman of those times the spectators paradise lost shakespeare and robinson crusoe stood for the admitted secular literature and beside them the bible and the works then published of mr jonathan edwards laid a little to one side as if of doubtful reputation was the only novel which the stricter people in those days allowed for the reading of their daughters that seven volumed trailing tedious delightful old bore sir charles grandison a book whose influence in those times was so universal that it may be traced in the epistolary style even of the gravest divines our little heroine was mortal with all her divinity and had an imagination which sometimes wandered to the things of earth and this glorious hero in lace and embroidery who blended rank gallantry spirit knowledge of the world disinterestedness constancy and piety sometimes walked before her while she sat spinning at her wheel till she sighed she hardly knew why that no such men walk the earth now yet it is to be confessed this occasional raid of the romantic into mary's balanced and well-ordered mind was soon energetically put to rout and the book as we have said remained on her table under protest protected by being her father's gift to her mother during their days of courtship the small looking-glass was curiously wreathed with corals and foreign shells so disposed as to indicate an artistic eye and skilful hand and some curious chinese paintings of birds and flowers gave rather a piquant and foreign air to the otherwise homely neatness of the apartment here in this little retreat mary spent those few hours which her exacting conscience would allow her to spare from her busy fingered household life here she read and wrote and thought and prayed and here she stands now arraying herself for the tea company that afternoon dress which in our days becoming in some cases the whole of woman was in those times a remarkably simple affair true every person of a certain degree of respectability had state and festival robes and a certain camphor wood brass bound trunk which was always kept solemnly locked in mrs katy scudder's apartment if it could have spoken might have given off quite a catalogue of brocade satin and laces the wedding suit there slumbered in all the unsullied whiteness of its stiff ground broidered with heavy knots of flowers and there were scarfs of wrought india muslin and embroidered crape each of which had its history for each had been brought into the door with beating heart on some return voyage of one who alas should return no more the old trunk stood with its histories its imprisoned remembrances and a thousand tender thoughts seemed to be shaping out of every rustling fold of silk and embroidery on the few yearly occasions when all were brought out to be aired their history related and then solemnly locked up again nevertheless the possession of these things gave to the women of an establishment a certain innate dignity like a good conscience so that in that larger portion of existence commonly denominated among them every day they were content with plain stuff and homespun mary's toilet therefore was sooner made than those of newport bells of the present day it simply consisted in changing her ordinary short gown and petticoat for another of somewhat nicer materials a skirt of india chintz and a striped jacquinet short gown her hair was of the kind which always lies like satin but nevertheless girls never think their toilet complete unless the smoothest hair has been shaken down and rearranged a few moments however served to braid its shining folds and dispose them in their simple knot on the back of the head and having given a final stroke to each side with her little dimpled hands she sat down a moment at the window thoughtfully watching where the afternoon sun was creeping through the slates of the fence in long lines of gold among the tall tremulous orchard grass and unconsciously she began warbling 
in a low gurgling voice the words of a familiar hymn whose grave earnestness accorded well with the general tone of her life and education life is the time to serve the lord the time to ensure the great reward there was a swish and rustle in the orchard grass and a tramp of elastic steps then the branches were brushed aside and a young man suddenly emerged from the trees a little behind mary he was apparently about twenty-five dressed in the holiday rig of a sailor on shore which well set off his fine athletic figure and accorded with a sort of easy dashing and confident air which sat not unhandsomely on him for the rest a high forehead shaded by rings of the blackest hair a keen dark eye a firm and determined mouth gave the impression of one who had engaged to do battle with life not only with a will but with shrewdness and ability he introduced the colloquy by stepping deliberately behind mary putting his arms round her neck and kissing her why james said mary starting up and blushing come now i have come haven't i said the young man leaning his elbow on the window-seat and looking at her with an air of comic determined frankness which yet had in it such wholesome honesty that it was scarcely possible to be angry the fact is mary he added with a sudden earnest darkening of the face i won't stand this nonsense any longer aunt katy has been holding me at arm's length ever since i got home and what have i done haven't i been to every prayer meeting and lecture and sermon since i got into port just as regular as a psalm book and not a bit of a word could i get with you and no chance even so much as to give you my arm aunt katy always comes between us and says here mary you take my arm what does she think i go to meeting for and almost break my jaws keeping down the gapes i never even go to sleep and yet i am treated in this way it's too bad what's the row what's anybody been saying about me i always have waited on you ever since you were that high didn't i always draw you to school on my sled didn't we always used to do our sums together didn't i always wait on you to singing school and i've been made free to run in and out as if i were your brother and now she is as glum and stiff and always stays in the room every minute of the time that i am there as if she was afraid i should be in some mischief it's too bad oh james i am sorry that you only go to meeting for the sake of seeing me you feel no real interest in religious things and besides mother thinks now i am grown so old that why you know things are different now at least we mustn't you know always do as we did when we were children but i wish you did feel more interested in good things i am interested in one or two good things mary principally in you who are the best i know of besides he said quickly and scanning her face attentively to see the effect of his words don't you think there is more merit in my sitting out all these meetings when they bore me so confoundedly than there is in your and aunt katie's doing it who really seem to find something to like in them i believe you have a sixth sense quite unknown to me for it's all a maze i can't find top nor bottom nor side nor up nor down to it it's you can and you can't you shall and you shan't you will and you won't james you needn't look at me so i'm not going to say the rest of it but seriously it's all anywhere and nowhere to me it don't touch me it don't help me and i think it rather makes me worse and then they tell me it's because i'm a natural man and the natural man understandeth not the things of the spirit well i am a natural man how's a fellow to help it well james why need you talk everywhere as you do you joke and jest and trifle till it seems to everybody that you don't believe in anything i'm afraid mother thinks you are an infidel but i know it can't be yet we hear all sorts of things that you say i suppose you mean my telling deacon twitchell that i had seen as good christians among the mahometans as any in newport didn't i make him open his eyes it's true too in every nation he that feareth god and worketh righteousness is accepted of him said mary and if there are better christians than us among the mahometans i am sure i am glad of it but after all the great question is are we christians ourselves oh james if you only were a real true noble christian well mary you have got into that harbour through all the sandbars and rocks and crooked channels and now do you think it right to leave a fellow beating about outside and not go out to help him in this way of drawing up among your good people and leaving us sinners to ourselves isn't generous you might care a little for the soul of an old friend anyhow 
and don't i care james how many days and nights have been one prayer for you if i could take my hopes of heaven out of my own heart and give them to you i would dr h preached last sunday on the text i could wish myself a curse from christ for my brother and my kinsman and he went on to show how we must be willing to give up even our own salvation if necessary for the good of others people said it was hard doctrine but i could feel my way through it very well yes i would give my soul for yours i wish i could there was a solemnity and pathos in mary's manner which checked the conversation james was the more touched because he felt it all so real from one whose words were always yea and nay so true so inflexibly simple her eyes filled with tears her face kindled with a sad earnestness and james thought as he looked of a picture he had once seen in a european cathedral where the youthful mother of sorrows is represented radiant and grave as pitying man's decline all youth but with an aspect beyond time mournful but mournful of another's crime she looked as if she sat by eden's door and grieved for those who should return no more james had thought he loved mary he had admired her remarkable beauty he had been proud of a certain right in her before that of other young men her associates he had thought of her as the keeper of his home he had wished to appropriate her wholly to himself but in all this there had been after all only the thought of what she was to be to him and this for this poor measure of what he called love she was ready to offer an infinite sacrifice as a subtle flash of lightning will show in a moment a whole landscape tower town winding stream and distant sea so that one subtle ray of feeling seemed in a moment to reveal to james the whole of his past life and it seemed to him so poor so meagre so shallow by the side of that childlike woman to whom the noblest of feelings were unconscious matters of course that a sort of awe awoke in him like the apostles of old he feared as he entered into the cloud it seemed as if the deepest string of some eternal sorrow had vibrated between them after a moment's pause he spoke in a low and altered voice mary i am a sinner no psalm or sermon ever taught it to me but i see it now your mother is quite right mary you are too good for me i am no mate for you oh what would you think of me if you knew me wholly i have lived a mean miserable shallow unworthy life you are worthy you are a saint and walk in white oh what upon earth could ever make you care so much for me well then james you will be good won't you talk with dr h hang dr h said james now mary i beg your pardon but i can't make head or tail of a word dr h says i don't get hold of it or know what he would be at you girls and women don't know your power why mary you are a living gospel you have always had a strange power over us boys you never talked religion much but i have seen high fellows come away from being with you as still and quiet as one feels when one goes into a church i can't understand all the hang of predestination and moral ability and natural ability and god's efficiency and man's agency which dr h is so engaged about but i can understand you you can do me good oh james can i mary i'm going to confess my sins i saw that somehow or other the wind was against me in aunt katie's quarter and you know we fellows who take up the world in both fists don't like to be beat if there's opposition it sets us on now i confess i never did care much about religion but i thought without being really a hypocrite i'd just let you try to save my soul for the sake of getting you but there's nothing sure to hook a woman than trying to save a fellow's soul it's a dead shot generally that now our ship sails to-night and i thought i'd just come across this path in the orchard to speak to you you know i used always to bring you peaches and june eatings across the way and once i brought you a ribbon yes i've got it yet james well now mary all this seems mean to me mean to try and trick and snare you who are so much too good for me i felt very proud this morning that i was to go out first mate this time and that i should command a ship next voyage i meant to have asked you for a promise but i don't only mary just give me your little bible and i'll promise to read it all through soberly and see what it all comes to and pray for me and if while i'm gone a good man comes who loves you and is worthy of you why take him mary that's my advice james i'm not thinking of any such things i don't ever mean to be married and i'm glad you don't ask me for any promise because it would be wrong to give it mother don't even like me to be much with you but i'm sure all i have said to you tonight is right i shall tell her exactly all i have said 
if aunt katie knew what things we fellows are pitched into who take the world head foremost she wouldn't be so selfish mary you girls and women don't know the world you live in you ought to be pure and good you are not as we are you don't know what men what women no they're not women what creatures beset us in every foreign port and boarding-houses that are gates of hell and then if a fellow comes back from all this and don't walk exactly straight you just draw up the hems of your garments and stand close to the wall for fear he should touch you when he passes i don't mean you mary for you are different from most but if you would do what you could you might save us but it's no use talking mary give me the bible and please be kind to my dove for i had a hard time getting him across the water and i don't want him to die if mary had spoken all that welled up in her little heart at that moment she might have said too much but duty had its habitual seal upon her lips she took the little bible from her table and gave it with a trembling hand and james turned to go in a moment he turned back and stood irresolute mary he said we are cousins i may never come back you might kiss me this once the kiss was given and received in silence and james disappeared among the thick trees come child said aunt katie looking in there is deacon twitchell's chaise in sight are you ready yes mother end of section three Section four of the Minister's Wooing. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Minister's Wooing by Harriet Beecher Stowe. Chapter four, part one. Theological Tea. At the call of her mother, Mary hurried into the best room with a strange discomposure of spirit she had never felt before. From childhood, her love for James had been so deep, equable, and intense that it had never disturbed her with thrills and yearnings. It had grown up in sisterly calmness, and quietly expanding had taken possession of her whole nature without her once dreaming of its power but this last interview seemed to have struck some great nerve of her being and calm as she usually was from habit principle and good health she shivered and trembled as she heard his retreating footsteps and saw the orchard grass fly back from under his feet it was as if each step trod on a nerve as if the very sound of the rustling grass was stirring something living and sensitive in her soul and strangest of all a vague impression of guilt hovered over her had she done anything wrong she did not ask him there she had not spoken love to him no she had only talked to him of his soul and how she would give hers for his oh so willingly and that was not love it was only what dr h said christians must always feel child what have you been doing said aunt katie who sat in full flowing chintz petticoat and spotless dimity short gown with her company knitting work in her hands your cheeks are as red as peonies have you been crying what's the matter there's the deacon's wife mother said mary turning confusedly and darting to the entry door enter mrs twitchell a soft pillowy little elderly lady whose whole air and dress reminded one of a sack of feathers tied in the middle with a string a large comfortable pocket hung upon the side disclosed her knitting work ready for operation and she zealously cleansed herself with a checked handkerchief from the dust which had accumulated during her ride in the old one hoss shay answering the hospitable salutation of katie scudder in that plaintive motherly voice which belongs to certain nice old ladies who appear to live in a state of mild chronic compassion for the sins and sorrows of this mortal life generally why yes miss scudder i'm pretty tolerable i keep goin and goin that's my way i's a-tellin the deacon this morning i didn't see how i was to come here this afternoon but then i did want to see miss scudder and talk a little about that precious sermon sunday how is the doctor blessed man well his reward must be great in heaven if not on earth as i was a-tellin the deacon and he says to me says he polly we mustn't be man-worshippers there dear to mary don't trouble yourself about my bonnet 
it ain't my sunny one but i thought twould do says i to serinthy ann miss scudder won't mind cause her heart's set on better things I always like to drop a word in season to serinthy ann cause she's clean took up with vanity and dress oh dear oh dear me so different from your blessed daughter miss scudder well it's a great blessing to be called in one's youth like samuel and timothy but then we doesn't know the lord's ways sometimes i gets clean discouraged with my children but then again i don't know none on us does serinthy ann is one of the most master hands to turn off work she takes hold and goes along like a woman and nobody never knows when that gal finds the time to do all she does do and i don't know nothing what i should do without her deacon was saying if ever she was called she'd be a martha and not a mary but then she's dreadful opposed to the doctrines oh dear me oh dear me somehow they seem to rile her all up and she was a-telling me yesterday when she was a-hanging out clothes that she never should get reconciled to decrees and lection cause she can't see if things is certain how folks is to help themselves says i serinthy and folks ain't to help themselves they's to submit unconditional and she just slammed down the clothes basket and went into the house when mrs twitchell began to talk it flowed a steady stream as when one turns a faucet that never ceases running till some hand turns it back again and the occasion that cut the flood short at present was the entrance of mrs brown mr simeon brown was a thriving shipowner of newport who lived in a large house owned several negro servants and a span of horses and affected some state and style in his worldly appearance a passion for metaphysical orthodoxy had drawn simeon to the congregation of dr h and his wife of course stood by right in a high place there she was a tall angular somewhat hard favoured body dressed in a style rather above the simple habits of her neighbours and her whole air spoke the great woman who in right of her thousands expected to have her say in all that was going on in the world whether she understood it or not on her entrance mild little mrs twitchell fled from the cushioned rocking-chair and stood with the quivering air of one who feels she has no business to be anywhere in the world until mrs brown's bonnet was taken and she was seated when mrs twitchell subsided into a corner and rattled her knitting-needles to conceal her emotion new england has been called the land of equality but what land upon earth is wholly so even the mites in a bit of cheese naturalists say have great tumblings and strivings about position and rank he who has ten pounds will always be a nobleman to him who has but one let him strive as manfully as he may and therefore let us forgive meek little mrs twitchell for melting into nothing in her own eyes when mrs brown came in and let us forgive mrs brown that she sat down in the rocking chair with an easy grandeur as one who thought it her duty to be affable and meant to be it was however rather difficult for mrs brown with her money house negroes and all to patronize mrs katy scudder who was one of those women whose nature seems to sit on thrones and who dispense patronage in favor by an inborn right and aptitude whatever be their social advantages it was one of mrs brown's trials of life this secret strange quality in her neighbor who stood apparently so far below her in worldly goods even the quiet positive style of mrs katy's knitting made her nervous it was an implication of independence of her sway and though on the present occasion every customary courtesy was bestowed she still felt as she always did when mrs katy's guest a secret uneasiness she mentally contrasted the neat little parlor with its white sanded floor and muslin curtains with her own grand front room which boasted the then uncommon luxuries of turkey carpet and persian rug and wondered if mrs katy did really feel as cool and easy in receiving her as she appeared you must not understand that this was what mrs brown supposed herself to be thinking about oh no by no means all the little mean work of our nature is generally done in a small dark closet just a little back of the subject we are talking about on which subject we suppose ourselves of course to be thinking of course we are thinking of it how else could we talk about it 
the subject in discussion at what mrs brown supposed to be in her own thoughts was the last sunday's sermon on the doctrine of entire disinterested benevolence in which good dr h had proclaimed to the citizens of newport their duty of being so wholly absorbed in the general good of the universe as even to acquiesce in their own final and eternal destruction if the greater good of the whole might thereby be accomplished well now dear me said mrs twitchell while her knitting needles trotted contentedly to the mournful tone of her voice i was telling the deacon if we only could get there sometimes i think i get a little way but then again i don't know but the deacon he's quite down he don't see no evidences in himself sometimes he says he don't feel as if he ought to keep his place in the church but then again he don't know he keeps a turnin and turnin on it over in his mind and a tryin himself this way and that way and he says he don't see nothin but what's selfish no way remember one night last winter after the deacon got warm in bed there comes a rap at the door and who should it be but old beulah ward wantin to see the deacon twas her boy she sent and he said beulah was sick and hadn't no more wood nor candles now i knowed the deacon had carried that critter half a cord of wood if he had one stick since thanksgiving and i've sent her two of my best moulds of candles nice ones that serinthy ann run when we killed a critter but nothing would do but the deacon must get right out his warm bed and dress himself and hitch up his team to carry over some wood to beulah says i father you know you be down with the rheumatiz for this besides beulah is real aggravatin i know she trades off what we send her to the store for rum and you never get no thanks she expects cause we has done for her we always must and more we do more we may do and says he to me says he that's just the way we sarves the lord polly and what if he shouldn't hear us when we call on him in our troubles so i shut up and the next day he was down with the rheumatiz and serinthy ann says she well father now i hope you'll own you have got some disinterested benevolence says she and the deacon he thought it over a spell and then he says i'm afraid it's all selfish i'm just a makin a righteousness of it and serinthy ann she come out declarin that the best folks never had no comfort in religion and for her part she didn't mean to trouble her head about it but have just as good a time as she could while she's young cause if she was elected to be saved she should be and if she want she couldn't help it anyhow mr brown says he came on to dr h s ground years ago said mrs brown giving a nervous twitch to her yarn and speaking in a sharp hard didactic voice which made little mrs twitchell give a gentle quiver and look humble and apologetic mr brown's a master thinker there's nothing pleases that man better than a hard doctrine he says you can't get em too hard for him he don't find any difficulty in bringing his mind up he just reasons it out all plain and he says people have no need to be in the dark and that's my opinion if folks know they ought to come up to anything why don't they he says and i say so too mr scudder used to say that it took great afflictions to bring his mind to that place said mrs katy he used to say that an old paper maker told him once that paper that was shaken only one way in the making would tear across the other and the best paper had to be shaken every way and so he said he, we couldn't tell till we had been turned and shaken and tried every way where we should tear mrs twitchell responded to this sentiment with a gentle series of groans such as were her general expression of approbation swaying herself backward and forward while mrs brown gave a sort of toss and snort and said that for her part she always thought people knew what they did know but she guessed she was mistaken the conversation was here interrupted by the civilities attendant on the reception of mrs jones a broad buxom hearty soul 
who had come on horseback from a farm about three miles distant smiling with rosy content she presented mrs katy a small pot of golden butter the result of her forenoon's churning there are some people so evidently broadly and heartily of this world that their coming into a room always materializes the conversation we wish to be understood that we mean no disparaging reflection on such persons they are as necessary to make up a world as cabbages to make up a garden the great healthy principles of cheerfulness and animal life seem to exist in them in the gross they are wedges and ingots of solid contented vitality certain kinds of virtues and christian graces thrive in such people as the first crop of corn does in the bottom lands of the ohio mrs jones was a church member a regular church-goer and planted her comely person plump in front of dr h every sunday and listened to his searching and discriminating sermons with broad honest smiles of satisfaction those keen distinctions as to motives those awful warnings and urgent expostulations which made poor deacon twitchell weep she listened to with great round satisfied eyes making to all and after all the same remark that it was good and she liked it and the doctor was a good man and on the present occasion she announced her pot of butter as one fruit of her reflections after the last discourse you see she said as i was a settin in the spring-house this mornin a workin my butter i says to dinah i'm goin to carry a pot of this down to miss scudder for the doctor i got so much good out of his sunday sermon and dinah she says to me says she laws miss jones i thought you was asleep for sartin but i wasn't only i forgot to take any caraway seed in the mornin and so i kinder missed it you know it livens one up but i never lost myself so but what i kinder heerd him goin on on sort o like and it sounded all sort o good and so i thought of the doctor to-day well i'm sure said aunt katy this will be a treat we all know about your butter mrs jones i shan't think of putting any of mine on table to-night i'm sure law now don't said mrs jones why you really make me ashamed miss scudder to be sure folks does like our butter and it always fetches a pretty good price he's very proud on it i tell him he oughtn't to be we oughtn't to be proud o anything and now mrs katy giving a look at the old clock told mary it was time to set the tea-table and forthwith there was a gentle movement of expectancy the little mahogany tea-table opened its brown wings and from a drawer came forth the snowy damask covering it was etiquette on such occasions to compliment every article of the establishment successively as it appeared so the deacon's wife began at the tablecloth well i do declare miss scudder beats us all in her tablecloths she said taking up a corner of the damask admiringly and mrs jones forthwith jumped up and seized the other corner why this here must have come from the old country it's most the beautifulest thing i ever did see it's my own spinning replied mrs katy with conscious dignity there was an irish weaver came to newport the year before i was married who wove beautifully just the old country patterns and i'd been spinning some uncommonly fine flax then i remember mr scudder used to read to me while i was spinning and aunt katy looked afar as one whose thoughts are in the past and dropped out the last words with a little sigh unconsciously as to herself while now i must say said mrs jones this goes quite beyond me i thought i could spin some but i shan't never dare to show mine i'm sure mrs jones your towels that you had out bleaching this spring were wonderful said aunt katy but i don't pretend to do much now she continued straightening her trim figure i'm getting old you know we must let the young folks take up these things mary spins better now than i ever did mary hand out those napkins and so mary's napkins passed from hand to hand 
well well said mrs twitchell to mary it's easy to see that your linen chest will be pretty full by the time he comes along won't it miss jones and mrs twitchell looked pleasantly facetious as elderly ladies generally do when suggesting such possibilities to younger ones End of section four. Section five of the minister's wooing. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The minister's wooing by Harriet Beecher Stowe chapter four part two mary was vexed to feel the blood boil up in her cheeks in a most unexpected and provoking way at the suggestion whereat mrs twitchell nodded knowingly at mrs jones and whispered something in a mysterious aside to which plump mrs jones answered why do tell now i never it's strange said mrs twitchell taking up her parable again in such a plaintive tone that all knew something pathetic was coming what mistakes some folks will make a fetchin up girls now there's your mary miss scudder why there ain't nothin she can't do but law i was down to miss skinner's last week a watchin with her and really it most broke my heart to see her her mother was a most amazin smart woman but she brought suki up for all the world as if she'd been a wax doll to be kept in the drawer and sure enough she was a pretty creature and now she's married what is she she hain't no more idee how to take hold than nothin the poor child means well enough and she works so hard she most kills herself but then she is in the suds from mornin till night she's one of the sort whose work's never done and poor george skinner's clean discouraged there's everything in knowing how said mrs katy nobody ought to be always working it's a bad sign i tell mary always do up your work in the forenoon girls must learn that i never work afternoons after my dinner dishes are got away i never did and never would nor i neither chimed in mrs jones and mrs twitchell both anxious to show themselves clear on this leading point of new england housekeeping there's another thing i always tell mary said mrs katy impressively never say there isn't time for a thing that ought to be done if a thing is necessary why life is long enough to find a place for it that's my doctrine when anybody tells me they can't find time for this or that i don't think much of em i think they don't know how to work that's all here mrs twitchell looked up from her knitting with apologetic giggle at mrs brown law now there's miss brown she don't know nothin about it cause she's got her servants to every turn i s'pose she thinks it queer to hear us talkin about our work miss brown must have her time all to herself i was tellin the deacon the other day that she was a privileged woman i'm sure those that have servants find work enough following em around said mrs brown who like all other human beings resented the implication of not having as many trials in life as her neighbours as to getting the work done up in the forenoon that's a thing i never can teach em they'd rather not chloe likes to keep her work round and do it by snacks any time day or night when the notion takes her and it was just for that reason i never would have one of those creatures round said mrs katy mr scudder was principled against buying negroes but if he had not been i should not have wanted any of their work i know what's to be done and most help is no help to me i want people to stand out of my way and let me get done i've tried keeping a girl once or twice and i never worked so hard in my life when mary and i do all ourselves we can calculate everything to a minute and we get our time to sew and read and spin and visit and live just as we want to here again mrs brown looked uneasy to what use was it that she was rich and owned servants when this mordecai in her gate utterly despised her prosperity 
in her secret heart she thought mrs katy must be envious and rather comforted herself on this view of the subject sweetly unconscious of any inconsistency in the feeling with her views of utter self-abnegation just announced meanwhile the tea-table had been silently gathering on its snowy plateau the delicate china the golden butter the loaf of faultless cake a plate of crullers or wonders as a sort of sweet fried cake was commonly called tea rusks light as a puff and shining on top with a varnish of eggs jellies of apple and quince quivering in amber clearness whitest and purest honey in the comb in short everything that could go to the getting up of a most faultless tea i don't see said mrs jones resuming the gentle peons of the occasion how miss scudder's loaf cake always comes out just so it don't rise neither to one side nor t'other but just even all round and it ain't white one side and burnt the other but just a good brown all over and it don't have any heavy streak in it just what serinthy ann was saying the other day said mrs twitchell she says she can't never be sure how hers is a comin out do what she can it will be either too much or too little but miss scudder's is always just so law says i serinthy ann it's faculty that's it them that has it has it and them that hasn't why they've got to work hard and not do half so well neither mrs katy took all these praises as matter of course since she was thirteen years old she had never put her hand to anything that she had not been held to do better than other folks and therefore she accepted her praises with the quiet repose and serenity of assured reputation though of course she used the usual polite disclaimers of oh it's nothing nothing at all i'm sure i don't know how i do it and was not aware it was so good and so on all which things are proper for gentlewomen to observe in like cases in every walk of life do you think the deacon will be along soon said mrs katy when mary returning from the kitchen announced the important fact that the tea-kettle was boiling why yes said mrs twitchell i'm a-lookin for him every minute he told me that he and the men should be plantin up to the eight acre lot but he'd keep the colt up there to come down on and so i laid him out a clean shirt and says now father you be sure and be there by five so that miss scudder may know when to put her tea a drawin there he is i believe she added as a horse's tramp was heard without and after a few moments the desired deacon entered he was a gentle soft-spoken man low sinewy thin with black hair showing lines and patches of silver his keen thoughtful dark eye marked the nervous and melancholic temperament a mild and pensive humility of manner seemed to brood over him like the shadow of a cloud everything in his dress air and motions indicated punctilious exactness and accuracy at times rising to the point of nervous anxiety immediately after the bustle of his entrance had subsided mr simeon brown followed he was a tall lank individual with high cheek-bones thin sharp features small keen hard eyes and large hands and feet simeon was as we have before remarked a keen theologian and had the scent of a hound for a metaphysical distinction true he was a man of business being a thriving trader to the coast of africa whence he imported negroes for the american market and no man was held to understand that branch of traffic better he having in his earlier days commanded ships in the business and thus learned it from the root in his private life simeon was severe and dictatorial he was one of that class of people who of a freezing day will plant themselves directly between you and the fire and there stand and argue to prove that selfishness is the root of moral evil simeon said he always had thought so and his neighbours sometimes supposed that nobody could enjoy better experimental advantages for understanding the subject he was one of those men who suppose themselves submissive to the divine will to the uttermost extent demanded by the extreme theology of that day simply because they have no nerves to feel no imagination to conceive 
what endless happiness or suffering is and who deal therefore with the great question of the salvation or damnation of myriads as a problem of theological algebra to be worked out by their inevitable x y z but we must not spend too much time with our analysis of character for matters at the tea-table are drawing to a crisis mrs jones has announced that she does not think he can come this afternoon by which significant mode of expression she conveyed the dutiful idea that there was for her but one male person in the world and now mrs katy says mary dear knock at the doctor's door and tell him that tea is ready the doctor was sitting in his shady study in the room on the other side of the little entry the windows were dark and fragrant with the shade and perfume of blossoming lilacs whose tremulous shadow mingled with spots of afternoon sunlight danced on the scattered papers of a great writing-table covered with pamphlets and heavily bound volumes of theology where the doctor was sitting a man of gigantic proportions over six feet in height and built every way with an amplitude corresponding to his height sitting bent over his writing so absorbed that he did not hear the gentle sound of mary's entrance doctor said the maiden gently tea is ready no motion no sound except the quick tracing of the pen over the paper doctor doctor a little louder and with another step into the apartment tea is ready the doctor stretched his head forward to a paper which lay before him and responded in a low murmuring voice as reading something firstly if underived virtue be peculiar to the deity can it be the duty of a creature to have it here a little waxen hand came with a very gentle tap on his huge shoulder and doctor t is ready penetrated drowsily to the nerve of his ear as a sound heard in sleep he rose suddenly with a start opened a pair of great blue eyes which shone abstractedly under the dome of a capacious and lofty forehead and fixed them on the maiden who by this time was looking up rather archly and yet with an attitude of the most profound respect while her venerated friend was assembling together his earthly faculties tea is ready if you please mother wished me to call you oh ah yes indeed he said looking confusedly about and starting for the door in his study gown if you please sir said mary standing in his way would you not like to put on your coat and wig the doctor gave a hurried glance at his study gown put his hand to his head which in place of the ample curls of his full-bottomed wig was decked only with a very ordinary cap and seemed to come at once to full comprehension he smiled a kind of conscious benignant smile which adorned his high cheek-bones and hard features as sunshine adorns the side of a rock and said kindly ah well child i understand now i'll be out in a moment and mary sure that he was now on the right track went back to the tea-room with the announcement that the doctor was coming in a few moments he entered majestic and proper in all the dignity of full-bottomed powdered wig full flowing coat with ample cuffs silver knee and shoe buckles as became the gravity and majesty of the minister of those days he saluted all the company with a benignity which had a touch of the majestic and also of the rustic in it for at heart the doctor was a bashful man that is he had somewhere in his mental camp that treacherous fellow whom john bunyan anathematizes under the name of shame the company rose on his entrance the men bowed and the women curtsied and all remained standing while he addressed to each with punctilious decorum those inquiries in regard to health and well-being which preface a social interview 
then at a dignified sigh from mrs katy he advanced to the table and all following his example stood while with one hand uplifted he went through a devotional exercise which for length more resembled a prayer than a grace after which the company were seated well doctor said mr brown who as a householder of substance felt a conscious right to be first in open conversation with the minister people are beginning to make a noise about your views i was talking with deacon timmins the other day down on the wharf and he said dr stiles said that it was entirely new doctrine entirely so and for his part he wanted the good old ways they say so do they said the doctor kindling up from an abstraction into which he seemed to be gradually subsiding well let them i had rather publish new divinity than any other and the more of it the better if it be but true i should think it hardly worth while to write if i had nothing new to say well said deacon twitchell his meek face flushing with awe of his minister doctor there's all sorts of things said about you now the other day i was at the mill with a load of corn and while i was a waitin amariah wadsworth come along with his'n and so while we were waitin he says to me why they say your minister is gettin to be an arminian and he went on a tellin how old mam badger told him that you interpreted some parts of paul's epistles clear on the arminian side you know mam badger's a master hand at doctrines and she's most an uncommon calvinist that does not frighten me at all said the sturdy doctor supposing i do interpret some texts like the arminians can't arminians have anything right about them who wouldn't rather go with the arminians when they are right than with the calvinists when they are wrong that's it you've hit it doctor said simeon brown that's what i always say i say don't he prove it and how are you going to answer him that gravels em well said deacon twitchell brother seth you know brother seth he says you deny depravity he's all for imputation of adam's sin you know and i have long talks with seth about it every time he comes to see me and he says that if we did not sin in adam it's given up the whole ground altogether and then he insists you're clean wrong about the unregenerate doings not at all not in the least said the doctor promptly i wish seth could talk with you some time doctor along in the spring he was down helping me to lay stone fence it was when we was fencing off the south pasture lot and we talked pretty nigh all day and it really did seem to me that the longer we talked the sodder seth grew he's a master hand at readin and when he heard that your remarks on dr mayhew had come out seth tackled up a purpose and come up to newport to get them and spent all his time last winter studying on it and making his remarks and i tell you sir he's a tight fellow to argue with why that day what with layin stone wall and what with arguin with seth i come home quite beat out miss twitchell will remember that he was said his helpmeet i member when he came home says i father you seem clean used up and i stirred round lively like to get him his tea but he just went into the bedroom and laid down a forced supper and i says to serinthy ann that's a thing i hadn't seen your father do since he was took with the typhus and serinthy ann she said she knew twant anything but them old doctrines that it was always so when uncle seth come down and after tea father was kinder chirked up a little and he and seth set by the fire and was a beginnin it again and i just spoke out and said now seth these air things doesn't hurt you but the deacon is weakly and if he gets his mind riled after supper he don't sleep none all night 
so says i you'd better just let matters stop where they be cause says i twon't make no difference for to-night which on ye's got the right on't reckon the lord'll go on his own way without you and we shall find out by and by what that is mr scudder used to think a great deal on these points said mrs katy and the last time he was home he wrote out his views i haven't ever shown them to you doctor but i should be pleased to know what you think of them mr scudder was a good man with a clear head said the doctor and i should be much pleased to see anything that he wrote a flush of gratified feeling passed over mrs katy's face for one flower laid on the shrine which we keep in our hearts for the dead is worth more than any gift to our living selves we will not now pursue our party further lest you reader get more theological tea than you can drink we will not recount the numerous nice points raised by mr simeon brown and adjusted by the doctor and how simeon invariably declared that that was the way in which he disposed of them himself and how he had thought it out ten years ago we will not relate either too minutely how mary changed colour and grew pale and red in quick succession when mr simeon brown incidentally remarked that the monsoon was going to set sail that very afternoon for her three years voyage nobody noticed in the busy amenities the sudden welling and ebbing of that one poor little heart fountain so we go so little knowing what we touch and what touches us as we talk we drop out a common piece of news mr so-and-so is dead miss such an one is married such a ship has sailed and lo on our right hand or our left some heart has sunk under the news silently gone down in the great ocean of fate without even a bubble rising to tell its drowning pang and this god help us is what we call living end of section five